Well, good morning, everyone. It's Thursday, and we have an exciting, for me, it's an exciting show because it's an exciting passage that we're digging into in our march through Revelation. We come to the last church that Jesus addressed in his beginning of his book before he gets into future uh, events, which starts tomorrow. So I don't think you're going to want to miss uh, tomorrow. But today, it's the seventh church, and it's the church that's the closest to the same situation that you and I find ourselves in. It's Laodicea, and it's in chapter 3, it's beginning at verse 14. The reason I say it's the closest to what we find ourselves in today is, is that Laodicea was a very wealthy city, uh, the most uh, wealthy of these seven cities that were addressed. And it seems that even though it's times of persecution, the way that Jesus talks to this church, it, it clearly makes me think that the Christians were doing quite well themselves. And the reality is, yes, we're in, we're in some hard times. This has been a hard year. But as far as I know, no one has starved. No one has gone without almost anything. I know we haven't. We live in a very wealthy, well, the world's wealthiest country. And we live in a wealthy area, especially, I mean, when you compare to the, the world that, you know, much of the world lives on two or three dollars a day, you know, we spend that for a cup of coffee. We have so much, you and I, and for as much as given to those who have much is given, much is required. And I kind of feel that that's what he is saying to Laodicea. By the way, Laodicea was so wealthy. We've talked in several of the other cities how there was a giant earthquake in that region in AD 17. The other cities had great damage and Rome rebuilt them. This city, Laodicea, had the same amount of damage, but they had their own means. They refused to ask Rome for help. They wanted to do it themselves and they did. They rebuilt the city. It was, it was just such a prosperous area through trade mostly. Verse 14 of chapter 3. Let's get digging in there. To the angel of the church in Laodicea, write this. These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. Jesus is the ruler of God's creation. Wow, we could stop right there. That's enough to worship him right there, isn't it? We owe our own existence and life to our Savior, Jesus. I know your deeds. And this is why this is probably the most famous letter to these churches in general. And I'm sure you've, you've heard a sermon or two on this next phrasing. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were one or the other. But because you are only lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. Part of the reason it's so famous is that's, that's such graphic language that Jesus uses. He does not like lukewarm Christians. And this is something that, that we all have to fight a little bit. I know that when, when I first came to the Lord in 1970, my enthusiasm was off the top. I couldn't wait to tell everybody. Maybe I was way, maybe I was too in one sense too enthusiastic. I wasn't wise in the way I brought up the Lord to my family and friends at times. But I kind of vowed back then. I I, I don't know if it's because I read this passage or, or whatever it was. I just made a vow to myself. I don't want to ever let my enthusiasm about Jesus and what He has done go cold. I'm not sure I use the term lukewarm, but I wanted to keep my enthusiasm. And at times it's been harder than others. But invariably, if I come back and get serious about the Lord and read my Bible and pray and do the things I know I'm supposed to do and share him whenever he brings the opportunity up, then that, that really helps my enthusiasm. Being in small groups uh, is a tremendous help. Being in an active church, great help. I want to keep my fire. But he says, he kind of gives their, 
the reasoning why some people struggle and why in America sometimes it's harder. You say, I am rich. I've acquired wealth and don't need a thing. But you don't realize that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Sometimes it's harder to share with a wealthy person who thinks they can buy all their needs than it is someone who is down and out, maybe a homeless, whatever. It, it, the, we as human beings get prideful and we think we can do it ourselves, but we have great need. And he says, in reality, in the long scheme of things, you are wretched and poor and blind. Well, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire. In other words, live with him. You can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shame, shameful nakedness. His language is so strong in this area. A salve to put on your eyes so those you can see. Sometimes, and then verse 19, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Sometimes Jesus does bring hard times to get our attention. And when, when he has it, then, then oftentimes those are the times that we turn back to the Lord. I just encourage it. Now we, we're in a hard time and Somebody just asked me uh, yesterday, do you think more people turned away from God in this pandemic or turned to God in this pandemic, kind of to relieve their pain? And I honestly didn't, I don't know how to answer that question. I don't know in raw numbers, but I do know there are people on both sides. There are people who have to come to God. Lots and lots. You see through all the food pantries and outreaches that we have done at Saddleback, you know, the, the tens of thousands that have come to Christ. But also know there are some people that have, if Lord would allow this to happen, I don't, you know, I don't understand it. So I don't, I don't want it. I don't like it. And they've turned away from God. It's both. It's both. We've got to make sure we're the ones that are allowing this time, which seems to about be over, to, in fact, bring us closer in our walk with Christ. We've got to use that time wisely. And then verse 20, one of the most quoted verses in the Bible, that can be our verse for today. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and I will eat with him and he with me. Jesus seeks your love. He seeks you. There's not, it, it's an act of when, when somebody knocks and goes to a house and knock, that's them making the effort to go. Well, Jesus is, is knocking on the door. He wants you to open your heart to him. I know he does. He says he does. He says he does. So please don't wait any longer. You know, Jesus, the fact that you're watching this show, it's not an accident. In God's sovereign love, he's had you tune in. If you've never done so before, open the door of your heart to Jesus. And just wherever you are, you can just pray, Lord, I invite you into my heart. I want to live for you. You mean that in your heart? He will live with you for eternity. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. To him who overcomes, I give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Well, friends, that's the end of our digging into these seven letters to the seven churches in seven real cities of that time. He says those same things to us at the church in Laguna Woods or whatever church you attend. He wants your loyalty, your faithfulness. Stand firm with him. And each one of those seven letters has a reward. And that reward can be for you. We'll tune back in tomorrow as we get a glimpse into what heaven is like. I can't wait. Okay. See you tomorrow. Bye for now. Oh